this morning we're finishing up the last message on right turn, wrong way. How many times have we done what we thought was the right turn and ended up being the wrong way, right? Um, oh, by the way, uh, I have this thing on my face, uh, stitches. I, you, you know, I'm a mountain biker, and there's a lot of, we'll go out to Lebanon Hills, and there's a bunch of jumps, and, and you, you, you know, I'm, I'm a young man, and I still can do all those jumps, and, and you take a jump, I think it was a five-foot jump, take that jump and land, and then there's a tree, and you hit that. Now, that would have been a cool story if that's really what happened. <laughs> that's not how I did this. That's how I wish I would have done it, and then I could have said that. Actually, all I did it was playing basketball, and some guy tried to rebound, hit me in the face, and 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 uh, you know, three stitches, four sti- four stitches later, I come home, and my daughter Bianca, who's a teenager, says, "Dad, that is sick. You, which is cool." <laughs> he says, "You look so cool." I'm like, all I had to do was get four stitches, and I am cool again. <laughs> Right? So if you want to get stitches, man, you'll be cool in their eyes. So right turn, wrong way. We're in the final message, and it's uh, extraordinary. We're, we're talking about being an extraordinary person. Now, if you're visiting today and somebody brought you here, you can put down your defenses because this is not the sermon part of this. Okay? Uh, there's no Bible verses. You can just put down your, mess, your, your defenses. I'll let you know when I'm going to like, do the sermon part. But right now, just put down all your defenses. This is, but I want to ask you a question. What if you decided to be an extraordinary person? What if today you made that decision where you said, I want to be an extraordinary person? You know, you you think of uh, when you go to work or, or people around you, what does it mean to be extraordinary? Because quite frankly, most people live ordinary lives. We just live as ordinary people. We believe that that's my lot in life is to be ordinary. And what we do is we go to, like, we watch television or we, we watch these shows where all these other people who are terrible examples for us are the extraordinary people in life, and, and they're really not extraordinary at all, right? And, and, we, and we think... Uh, we think for a moment, you know, maybe, maybe just I'm just an ordinary person. I'm, I'm really nobody knows who I am. I, I'm just, you know, just a common Joe person. But what if, what if we decided that we were going to be extraordinary people? And and when I say extraordinary, I don't mean extraordinary at something. I mean an extraordinary person, because we all know people who are extraordinary at a sport or an activity, or some, some skill, but they are not extraordinary people. In fact, they're jerks, or they're just, in other areas of their lives, they're just, they're not good people at all, right? And so, what if we made the decision to be an extraordinary person? What if today, we said, if we were here, and we saw our boss here, or our spouse is here, or our kids are here, what if we saw them today, and they, they sat through this, this message this morning, and they heard about being an extraordinary person, and then we go to work tomorrow, how many people in this room would say, would say, you know what, I saw you at that service tomorrow, I know how to be an extraordinary boss, or an extraordinary husband, or a extraordinary, I, I, I saw you at, the, but don't you worry, I don't, you don't need to be extraordinary. I don't expect you to be extraordinary. You just go right ahead and be an ordinary boss. How many in this room would say, you probably wouldn't say that. You probably wouldn't go home today and say, honey, you know, I just, th- I just think you're ordinary. I just want you to be ordinary. You're your kids. D- you heard that, kids? He said, you're extraordinary, but don't believe it because you're not extraordinary. You're just ordinary kids. How many, how many know that you would not do that to your kids or your spouse? You would want them to be extraordinary. You'd want your boss to be extraordinary. Isn't it interesting that we expect extraordinary from other people, but we don't really believe that's for us? Like, we want them. You say, well, I don't expect them to be extraordinary. Sure you do. Every time you complain about something that they do, it's a result of them wanting to be extraordinary when you're really not trying to be extraordinary at all. Right? So what if, what if, just saying, what if we attempted to be extraordinary people? You know, what if, have we ever, we're so busy, have you ever stopped to consider what kind of person you really want to be? When you think about it, have you ever stopped and said, this is the kind of person I would like people to know about me. At my funeral, if I could like raise from the dead for five minutes, 
I would want them to say this about me at my funeral, right? And there's some, how many, I've been in funerals where they're very much said. Because if you can't have not, anything nice to say, you don't say it, right? <laughs> right? And, and you know your friends are talking about you as soon as you leave. What are they saying about you? When you leave like a, the, the office or you're leaving wherever you work, you know people are, how many know that when you go to a family reunion or like Christmas with your family or Thanksgiving and, and you get in a car and they hug everyone, love you, thank you so much for coming. Oh yeah, have a great day and you're waving and you're, yeah, yeah, bye in the car, but they honk the horn, ah, yeah, bye, bye. As soon as they shut the door, can you believe what she did? <laughs> They really need to discipline those kids. They were running all over the place. How many know that they're saying stuff about, so what is it? You can't control, every, oh, some of your grandmothers in the room are like, oh, great. Now that's all I'm going to hear about. So, somebody, you can't control everything that happens to you, but you can certainly control how you respond to it. So what if, what if we decided to be extraordinary people? What if we stopped and said, you know what, I, I can be extraordinary. And quite frankly, I am extraordinary. So we're going to start this way this morning. And, and it's pretty full in here. And, and some of you may be visiting today and you think, well, this is weird. You know, I don't even know the person next to me. Just, and, and, and I believe there's a statement I make at the end of this message that's so true. It's better to be, it's better to be higher on yourself than to be lower on yourself. Because God created you. He is the artist. And it's better to, it, not to be arrogant, but it's better to, think, it's better to think better of who you are than to diminish what he created. Okay? So you can turn to the person next to you. And I'll, this, I'll explain this over time, over this message. You can turn to him and say, you know what? Just, just say this with all sincerity. Go, I'm an extraordinary person. Okay? So they're turning to the person and say, and say it just like that. I'm an extraordinary person. <laughs> now, now, if you're visiting today and you're uncomfortable with being in church and, you know, preach, and now you can put up your defenses if you're that person because now I'm going to preach. He said, that wasn't preaching. Now, now you can do all that stuff you want to do. Now I'm going to actually preach the message. Here's the reality is if you're like most people in the world, you believe that we only live life one time. Now I know there are some that you believe that, that we reincarnate as a cat or a dog or a cow or something like that. I know there's a worldview. Uh, that, that there, but, but if you believe that you live one time, that we live one time, we die, and this body, dies, and, and I believe as a believer, when we live, we never really ever die. We go into eternity, so it's impossible to be reincarnated because once you leave this body, the Bible says you're present with the Lord, right? If you live one time in life, this point is extremely important because if you're a Christian or a Jew, you believe that God lives in you. That the Spirit of God that raised Christ from the dead, I mean, literally, Christ didn't raise himself from the dead. The Spirit in Christ raised him from the dead. That same Spirit lives in me. Amen. Now, how crazy is that? I mean, that's crazy. You're telling me that God's in me right now? Yeah. I mean, isn't that insane? God lives in me. And so the same power that when Jesus walked the earth, he did all of those extraordinary things that we saw. He like healed the, the blind man, the lame man. He went into the tomb and he, and he said, Lazarus, come out of the tomb. And we all know he said, Lazarus, because everybody would have come up out of their tomb had he said to arise, you know, all that. He did extraordinary things. That spirit that was in Jesus that did all of those signs, wonders, that spirit where Jesus said the same things you saw me do, you'll do in greater measure. The same things I did, you'll do in that same spirit that was in him lives in us. And it's extremely important we understand that because if that's true, then we don't have an option to be extraordinary or not. Even if you didn't say to the person next to you, if you call yourself a believer, you're extraordinary. 
That's pretty cool. Okay, because you didn't do anything but invite Jesus to come into your life. And if you're here today and you've never invited Jesus to come into your life, you will never be extraordinary until you actually invite Jesus to come into your life. Because without him, we're nothing. But in him, we can do all things, right? Because Jesus in us does. Now, now we're in the book of Judges. And it's interesting because in the book of Judges, and that's where the series has really been, we've talked about Israel. And Israel has been this, like this hope, this lighthouse, this bastion of hope for all of the world. And God had this idea, you know, I'm going to have a nation and I'm going to call them Israel. And Abraham's going to create this nation of people and they're going to serve one God where all the other nations were serving many different gods. And, and, uh, and this nation is going to be like this, this, this place where they follow only me and all the other nations are going to, they're going to look at them. They're going to look at how blessed they are. Look at the favor they have. Look at how their God does for them, protects them, keeps them. In, in battles, I'm running out of breath. In battles, uh, he's there with them. He fights for them. They don't even have to go to battle and they win. It's amazing. That's the kind of nation we want to follow. That's the God we want to serve. And yet, and God gives them the promised land and they get there and, and that's what happens. Joshua is now handing off the, he's saying, you guys, follow God and, and it's right between Saul and Joshua, this period of judges and, and what's happening is, is, is the people of Israel, they're looking at all the nations around them and instead of being the example they're looking at them and going, boy, I like the way they do that. I really like how that's happening. I, lo- I, love, I love the way their holiday and how they do that holiday. And, what it, and, and pretty soon they get enticed by all the... They're too busy looking around instead of looking up. And they, they see, even though they were given the authority of being the sons and daughters of God, they lowered themselves to being the slaves of God to the point where the slave took over them. And they went into bondage. And so they loved the nation of Midian and Amalekites. And before they knew it, they got so ravaged by it that literally what happened, they began to rule over the Israelites. So what would happen is called this contemporary cycle. They they served God. Then they disobeyed all of the things that protect them. And they would get in bond and they cry out to God. And God is a merciful God. And God said, I'm going to send a deliverer. And God sent a deliverer. And he says, now listen. The, the reason, it's not me punishing you, but the reason this is happening is because these practices, these acts produce this kind of bondage. And they said, we'll never do it again. We'll never do it again. We'll never do it again. How many know, know what that's like? I'll never do it again. And then, and then what happens? And then we do it again. And we're all there. And we go through this terrible ravaging cycle. Now, now we know because Jesus came, he died on the cross, he forgave us of all of our sins, past, present, and that was an easy test. Uh, for those that are visiting, we love to talk to each other. And so on the easy ones, you can talk back to me, okay? And so, 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 and future. So God forgives us our sins, and now we're sitting at the same place. And yet, because of grace, because we're, we're not, everything is permissible, it's not necessarily beneficial. Right? Because grace set us free from the stain of sin, but the effects of those sins can still bring you into bondage. Does that make sense? So I'm under grace, praise the Lord, but if I cheat on my wife, I'm going to be under something else. Mainly a hammer or a golf club or, you know, something. Right? Right? And so, so what happens is we live in a world right now where our culture is literally, and in this series, I've been very direct with things that are just not good for believers. It's not good for us. And we've been talking about, it seems like it's right, the right turn, but it ends up being the wrong way. And, and how we really need to go to the Lord and say, God, it seems right to a man, but it's not really right. And now we're, last week we talked about Samson. If you weren't here, you can go on Bethelsrock.org. You can hear the message last week on Samson. It's a little spicy. I got a number of emails. uh, Some saying it was the best message they had ever heard, and others saying I was really uncomfortable. One of the points was, uh, how stupid can any man be? Or no, actually it was, can a man really be that stupid? And the answer to that was, yes. Yes. A man can be that stupid. So you want to go online and listen to that message. But this time, Samson was one of those judges that God sent. And he, he, even though, this is cool about Samson, 
even though he wasn't necessarily a great judge, in the end, God used Samson to deliver Israel. Even though he messed up, even though he made state mistakes, God had put his spirit in him and used Samson to do a great and mighty thing in the end. Okay? In this case, Israel had messed up. They needed to deliver again. They're being overwhelmed by the Midianites and the Amalekites and other nations. And God sends them to deliver. His name is Gideon. And Gideon was a good judge. He was a man. And we're going to talk about Gideon and how this really applies to our life. Go to Judges 6.1. We're going to look at this. Because God has called Gideon to come out of his ordinary mindset. And, and quite frankly, like last week, I said, and, and you saw it in the, the review there, that like Samson, we may not have the physical strength. Samson had to have looked like me. Okay? Now, obviously, I don't look like I have a lot of muscles. Right? They're hidden right now. But... Samson impressed people. They said, what was the seeker's great strength? Had he had a lot of muscles, they wouldn't have asked the question. He had to be an ordinary looking man that had great strength. And quite frankly, we're ordinary looking men that have great strength, just as Samson is. And the reality is, is a lot of times, the, the bondage of ordinary thinking is our bondage. Where we think we're just ordinary people, nothing special about me, there's nothing. When in reality, the same spirit that raised Christ from, this is uncomfortable when I look at you, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry. She's new here too, right? <laughs> the, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, that's pretty extraordinary, yeah. is in me. Yeah. I don't have a choice. Right? So to be ordinary takes work. And so when you wake up in the morning and, and, and you wake up and you open your peepers and, and, and you, you try to roll out of bed and realize you're not out of bed yet. Right? How many have that feeling? That'll come where you're laying there and you thought, I thought I rolled out already. You know, and your body didn't mind your, your mind. Your mind said you were out, but your body didn't move. <laughs> right? Anyone there yet? <laughs> Help me. <laughs> and, and you roll out and you get out of bed and you go to brush your teeth and, and, and you go to do, you take a shot. You do ordinary things, but when you wake up, you have to work to be ordinary. And the problem is, people, believers, Christians, are literally working to be ordinary. There, there's a lot of Christians, but not very many believers. A lot of people profess to be followers of Christ, but they don't believe what Christ believed. You see, I always, I always say that Christ, or believers, are like the Green Beret, the Navy SEAL uh, of the Christian movement. Because believers cannot be stopped. When you begin to believe what the Bible says about you and stop believing what the world says about you, you will never be stopped. When you stop believing all the lies that the world says you're dumb, maybe you were, maybe, you know, in the millennial generation, they were brought up, brought up as babies being told they were special and no one's like you and you're wonderful. So maybe it's easier for the millennial to believe a lot of what God says about you, but there is a generation where you had parents that said you're worthless, you're no good, you were an accident, you'll never add up to anything, just be normal, you're not extraordinary, just try to make it in life, just survive. And maybe, and, and really, maybe you're here today and you just believe, you've believed believe the lie, you believe what friends have told you about you, you there, there's just things that stuck with you and you just, you, you're just caught up in that. And can I tell you, that's a lie of the enemy against you. And even as I'm talking about this right now, because I've been praying for you this week, even as I'm talking about this, things are coming to your mind right now because the Holy Spirit is bringing it to your mind saying, don't listen to this guy because you're Because you got an issue with this, or you're not that kind of person. Let's take a look at Judges 6 1. Here's what it says And again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Now, let me be very clear on this, and even how it's written in English, you can miss this, but if you read it in the Hebrew, I assure you, you read this in the Hebrew, it's written more, it's written in this, this connotation. God did not give them to the Midianites because he says, These are my people. He said, you've desired to serve and to do this. 
I'm going to take away my hand and give you what you desire, and you're going to get the consequences for your desires. And he removed, because God's character loves you. I guarantee you, God never took his eyes off the Israelites. Even though he removed his hand, he never took his eye off for a moment, took his eye off, because he loves them. But he removed their hands. So when it says that, gave them into the hands, he said basically, he, and he said, that you're going to experience what my hand does to bless you and to cover you and protect you. Isn't it great to know we will never know what we could have experienced if God had not been there? Amen. I'm okay with not knowing. Uh, okay, God, I, I'm not that curious. I do not need to, I don't need to know what I'm missing by not serving you. Praise the Lord, right? Okay, so, so go to the next verse. Because the power of the Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Next verse. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern people invaded the country. They camped on the land, ruined the crops all the way to Gaza, and did not spare a living thing for is there neither sheep nor cattle nor donkeys. Next verse. And Midian was so, imp so impoverished, the Israelites, they cried out to the Lord for help. So Midian, the Midianites were so oppressive. I mean, they, they took all of their food. They killed everything. They, they've ravished everything about that person. Maybe you're here today, and your life has been ravished. Maybe things in your life. I mean, when we think about what alcohol, can I, can I say this? Alcohol has become a god in our society now, some of you are not amening that. And I understand, I'm not even saying that you should, I'm not saying you, it's just, just the way. What I'm saying is, you can't go anywhere in our, where they don't glorify the worship of alcohol. You can't have a party unless you have alcohol. You, I mean, we gotta, you can't be yourself unless you get drunk or buzzed, right? Because I, I'm a fun person when I start drinking, Right? Why don't that, <laughs> smile, smile. You're saying, well, I, I just, listen, alcohol has become a God. And I, in this series, I've talked about all kinds of things that, that the church has really kind of slipped on because, because we're, we're, we, we, we've, we've said, oh, great, I am saved by grace, and we are. Now I'm just going to do anything I want. Can I, can I tell you what grace does? It changes your wants. It does. Now, does it do it overnight? No. It's a thing called sanctification. It changes who we are. Thank God. Praise the Lord that we don't have to be perfect the next day. It, did any, that happen to anyone, by the way? Because if it did, we don't like you very much. How many know that God, he changes us in his time, praise the Lord. And when the Holy Spirit, he just kind of takes desires right out of us. But, but the reality is the world is wanting to influence us and oppress us and impoverish us just like the Midianites did to the Israelites. The world is trying to take their culture and we're, Christians are looking around at the culture of the world rather than the, the kingdom of God and saying, I'm really, I really like that in the culture. I'm really, but, but the reality is the reason they're in slavery and bondage is because they're involved with things that bring slavery and bondage. Did you know God never gave a command that was, was for no reason at all? Every command God ever did, he gave because it was for your best interest. So when your dad said, don't put your finger in the, in the outlet, there's a reason for that. Would you all like to figure out what that is? Any volunteers that would want to put their finger in this outlet, we undid it. You can touch it. We're all looking forward to someone saying yes. How many know that it's not smart to do that, right? Did I stop being the son of my father because I did what he, didn't tell, he told me not to do? Did, did my father divorce me as a child because I didn't obey him? It, uh, now, he wanted to a few times. If my dad were here, he'd say, yeah, I wanted to a few times. But I am still James Bifford, the son of Jonathan Bifford. Right? So, so understand that there are things that God wants to keep us from. And so he says, listen, that's not good for you. And he brings us back. And he brings us back to that. This, this is where the ultimate blessing is, where you're really going to experience all of this if you come back. Okay, are you with me? Now, look at this next verse. So they're oppressed. 
And the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the rock, the oak in Oprah. It's actually Ophrah, but Oprah was probably around at that time. You know, she's old enough. <laughs> the angel of the Lord came, sat down under the oak in Oprah that belonged to Joash, you know where he's from, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. Now, I've had an opportunity to be in Israel. And I've been in a wine press. And it's this rock. It's like a rock almost in a cave where they've hewn out this area in a rock. It's almost like a cave. And they have this trench trough that's made of like rock. And, and, they, and what they do is they put the fruit in the center and then the juice runs out. The oil does the same thing. Olive oil comes in the same way. And they squeeze it and they squeeze it down and the, and the oil runs out the side. And this guy is threshing wheat in a place where they did not want wind. You did not want wind in a in a wine press because if you got wind dirt would flow in with the wind and would get in their their olive oil or wine press that they had and so they took it to a place where there was no wind a place that was secluded almost hidden because they didn't want any anything to bother that and and this guy is threshing wheat which if you're threshing wheat you wanted the highest windiest place you could find so he is threshing because what they would do is they would throw the wheat in the air the, uh, the shaft and all the stuff you didn't want would blow away and the seed would fall to the ground and that's how they would thresh wheat. So you wanted a very windy place. This guy's threshing wheat in a wine press. Now, there's one of two things. Either he's just stupid or there's another reason he's doing this. And there's really another reason he's doing this. And here, the, the Lord is sitting there. Go to the next verse. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. <laughs> now Gideon, why he's threshing wheat in a wine press is because he's scared to death. He is afraid that the Amalekites are going to come, kill him, take all of his wheat, do whatever. No one will even know that he was killed. I mean, he is trying to hide from the Amalekites and the Midianites. So this man comes, sits by a tree and sees him and goes, hey, mighty warrior. He's like, what, what are you talking about, mighty warrior? Are you being sarcastic or something? I mean, why are you so rude? I mean, you just come sit down by the tree, and you're going to start insulting me like that, mighty warrior. I'm no mighty warrior. I'm sticking down here with my threshing wheat in a wine press, mighty warrior. What, are you making fun of me? You want to fight? <laughs> That's really not how I got my stitches. It really was basketball. <laughs> mighty warrior. He's saying you're calling me a mighty warrior? Go to the next verse. But sir, which I think is funny, because he knew this was the angel of God. And he goes, but sir, you know, what will you say to God when he appears to you under an oak tree? But sir, <laughs> how, will you, how will you refer? But sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Interesting. You know, there are a lot of Christians saying, you know, if God's for me, because there's this argument in our head. If I'm a mighty warrior, if I'm extraordinary, and you're saying I'm extraordinary, then why does all this stuff happen to me? Why is this taking place in my life? Why does all this bad stuff happen to me? If I'm exactly what you said I am, if I'm the son or daughter of God, if I got the spirit of God living, why is this happening to me? Taking place. And look at the next verse. It goes on. Where, where are all the wonders that our fathers told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? Where are all the miracles? If I'm extraordinary, where are all the miracles? Why am I not seeing all the things that, that, that my father saw or my grandfather, the stuff we read about in the Bible? Why aren't we seeing all of that stuff? Go to the next verse. But now the Lord has abandoned us and put us into the hand of the Midianites. Now I'm in bondage. You know, it's interesting. The Lord didn't put them into anything. They put themselves into it. But it's amazing how we blame God for the circumstances we end up in. You know, God is a great God. That is a great place to go, amen. amen. You know, God likes hearing you say amen when you say God's a great God. Amen. amen. Right. And, and, and the reality is, is when we sit there and we say, you know, God put me here and God says, I put you there. I gave you free will. I'm the one that delivers you out of all your bad decisions. But you chose to go there. But you know what's interesting? And this is what I love about God. 
Are you, are you listening to me? Everyone listening? God never brings it up. God never brings it up. And you can read in the Bible again and again, when men put themselves into bondage, God never comes and says, it's your fault you're there. Even though he gets the blame for something he didn't even do. Now, if my kids do that, I'm like, well, if you had listened to me, you would not have ended up there. Right? What did I tell you? Your dad knows everything. Right? How many dads are with me? Dads, you should have said amen there. Dad knows, Father Knows Best, my favorite show. Some of you don't even know what that is. See, this is the part I love about God. God chooses not to point out where you messed up. He's always focused on what sets you free. Because he knows who you are. He knows where you're wanting to go. And he knows the enemy. He knows how evil he is. He knows what he can do to get you to trip up. And he's not going to focus on what the enemy's doing. He's focusing on what he's going to do in you and through you. So when you go to God and you sense condemnation, that ain't God. There's a little black in me coming out. <laughs> T.D. Jakes. Right? <laughs> Close. <laughs> I'll work on that. <laughs> that ain't God. That's the devil trying to act like God, trying to get you to think that God's upset with you and he's angry with you, and that's why he'll never use you. God can't use you. I, and, and he'll even say, I can't use you because you did this, this, and this, and this, and this. You just say, liar, liar, shut up, devil. Because God doesn't point out all of my failures. He points out all of my future. Amen. He always takes you to your future. Jesus, some of you are saying, no, no, I don't, I don't, I don't know if I agree with that. Jesus, John 3.16 is great, one of the most famous verses, right? And then he goes on, he says, I did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that through me you might be saved. He didn't come to condemn. Satan came to condemn. He said, I didn't come to be the judge, I came to be the deliverer. Praise the Lord. So you have to understand who's speaking to you. So he says, but he's abandoned. Let's go to the next verse. This, this is where the Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hands. Go in the strength that you have. He's in a threat. I mean, he is in this, this, this wine press. He, he is this, 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 um, this afraid coward, he, he sees himself as a failure, he's a nobody, and he's sitting in here, and God calls him a mighty warrior, and he's like, you, you know, I'm not a mighty warrior, everybody says this about me, and he's, he's saying, well, I want you to go, and you're going to deliver, de deliver Israel. Now, what would you be thinking if you were Gideon? Now, remember, we're looking at the whole story and seeing what ends at the end. But if you were Gideon and you didn't know the end of the story, what would you be thinking? Okay? And you know what Gideon says? Look at what Gideon says. He goes, I am not sending you. Go to the next, next one. The, but the Lord Gideon asked, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. I'm... A, I'm, I'm I'm a nobody. Like, if I were to die in this thing, I don't know that anyone would know I'm dead. Now, can I stop? Because I've been praying about this for, for, for this Sunday. And you know what the danger is? Just stop. Put down your defenses now, because I'm going to stop preaching. I just want to talk to you about something. In this room, right now, the thought that goes through your head is, I'm, I'm really just like anyone else. I got a lot of problems in my life. I mean, I'm not rich. I'm not well-known. I mean, I'm not even really popular. I, I don't have much influence. In fact, I got four friends in Facebook, and I paid three of them to be my friends. <laughs> I mean, you're saying I'm extraordinary, but everything in my life says I'm not. How can I believe you? How can I believe that that's true? 
And Gideon's sitting there, and Gideon's going, I am the least in the least tribe, and I am the least of the least. I am the weakest of the weakest. I am a nobody. I'm too old. I'm too, I, it's, it's like saying, I went to junior college. Mm-hmm. Like, I, who am I? Maybe I didn't even graduate high school. I messed up my family. I'm divorced. I'm, I, you don't realize, I've bro- my life is is not in a good place. And you're saying I'm extraordinary? I'm, I'm not getting that. And you, now you know what Gideon was thinking. And Gideon said, hey, God, I am the least of the least. You know what God said? Look how God responds. Oh, my, never mind. I, I must have made a mistake. I came to the wrong house. <laughs> oh, even God makes mistakes sometimes. If you believe that, you need to read your Bible. That is a good reason why you should be reading your Bible if you think that's right. Here's what God really said. Here's what he really said. The Lord answered, I will be with you. And you will strike down the Midianites. You will Strike down all the Midianites because it doesn't matter what you think about yourself. The reality is this is who you are. And the same spirit, think about this. The same spirit that was in Christ is in you. Christ, you see, here's the thing we make a mistake and we think, well, Christ was God and then he had the spirit in him, and it was the two God. And it, no, no, you got to understand Hebrews. Hebrews said that Christ made himself man. Mm-hmm. He said he made himself no more than you currently are right now. You said, well, he, he, he didn't sin, and I did. That's why Jesus died on the cross, forgave you of your sins. Now in God's eyes, you are just like Jesus was. So that excuse the devil puts up there that you're not even, Jesus wiped, am I right? Am I lying to you? Did he not forget? So you're as Jesus was, and then the spirit came on Jesus and his ministry began. Right? The Holy Spirit came on him and resided in him. And when he died, that spirit raised him from the dead. Okay? And by the way, it's in you. You have to be disobedient to not be or extraordinary. Because it is natural for the sons and daughters of Christ, of God, to be extraordinary. Because that's our dad. God is our father. God is our father. Now, I, I, you know, you should preach sometime. Because I'm looking at faces, and it is like some I'm hitting walls, and other I'm like hitting in this ricocheting back at me, going pow, like right there. Right. The, here's the reality. You have built such a wall that you're just an average normal Gideon that you can, and yet Gideon with 300 men destroyed a whole army with lights and trumpets. That's pretty extraordinary. I, I mean, I play trumpet. Okay, I thought about pulling it out and actually doing a solo here this morning, but my wife begged me not to do that. Right? Here, here, here's the thing is, you have to come to the realization of this question. What if I lived an extraordinary life? What if I put down my fear? What if I put down what the world says about me? What if I put down the cowardice spirit? Because the Bible says that I didn't give you that spirit of fear. God's saying, I didn't give you the spirit of fear. I didn't give you that. That wasn't from me. But of boldness. But of boldness and of power and a sound mind. A mind that understands this is who I am because of who Christ is in me that I'm extraordinary. And what if I believe it? Because if, if I believe it, I will do it. Because I only do what I believe. I can know that I should do it. I can know that I'm extraordinary, but I can only do what I believe. Gideon, will you simply live like a man who is confident that God is with you? And if he is with you, who can be against you? 
If God is with you, live confident in that sense. When you wake up in the morning, I'm going to live confidently as if God is with me. Romans 8, 31, 3,300 years later, it said, uh, a man by the name of Paul wrote this in Romans, go, yeah, go back to 31. He wrote this. He says, if God is for you, who can be against you? Go to verse 32. He who did not, because you may be sitting there, how do I know that this isn't you? You're, you're pastor, you're paid, you know, you, you get up there and you speak. How do I know that I can really trust this? Well, easy. Here, here's what he said. He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? If God would die for you, you know what's interesting is one thing that has never been able to be debated is that Jesus died on a cross for you. You know, they've tried to prove he's been married, Jesus is married, and they couldn't prove it and found out it was a hoax. And, and, you know, 2020 datelined at all these things about Jesus' wife and daughter, Sarah. He had a daughter named Sarah and then found out it was a joke and they couldn't put it on national TV because it would have humiliated the fact that they were just trying to lie. It was actually reported in the New York Times that they believed a hoax because they cannot, why would the disciples all be martyred for a lie if Jesus had not risen from the dead? All but one was martyred. They tried to martyr John, murder John or kill John. They put him in a pot of boiling oil, but he was extraordinary and it didn't work. So they stuck him on an island because they couldn't kill him. It's interesting too, John never abandoned Jesus. He was the one disciple that always stayed within distance of Jesus. And they could not kill him. The disciples died because they knew who Jesus was. And he knew what he did. If we had a real revelation of who Christ was, what he did in our life, and the gift that lives in us, we would be totally different people than we are right now. And this city would be eternally affected. Eternally. Because we could not walk through these streets and let sick people be sick without us first praying for them and saying, I got an extraordinary God living in me. There ain't going to be sick people in my neighborhood that I haven't prayed for. And they think, well, they'll think you're a weird, freaky, like strange person. That is the devil making you think that way. You know, I pray for people in the gymnasium in front of everybody. You know what they think of me? He's that pastor. And whenever somebody's sick, they ask me to pray for them. And you say, well, I don't want to be ordinary. Then be extraordinary. But before you can do that, before a Gideon could be extraordinary, he had to take 300 men to a battle. It takes a step of faith. Amen. To do something extraordinary requires you to believe it, and once you believe it, the steps will be easy because you'll take them whenever they come. But you got to first believe. And the one thing that's resisting right now, and can you close your eyes for a moment? The one thing that's resisting right now is nothing but you believing. Can you believe? Is it possible that what he's saying is true? Is it possible that I'm not a mistake, that I'm not dumb? Is it possible that God, he created me with a purpose? Is it possible that God lives in me and that God could do supernatural? Is it possible that I don't need a pastor to pray for the sick or to do things? Is it possible I could do that? I mean, I'm not, I, I've always thought I'm not very smart and, and, I'm, and I'm just, no, and I'm not the kind of person that becomes famous. I'm just a nobody. But is it possible that I could be just like Gideon and God has something in store for me? Can I tell you something? The only, reason you, wait, the only way you'll find out is if you take the step into the extraordinary life that God has for you. You can look back up here. You can know God is for you because 2,000 years ago he gave his son to pay the price for all of your sins. 
So I, I leave you with this question. What if starting today, we chose to live extraordinary lives? What if this week we said for this week, I, I'm not going to say I'm going to do it for all. What if this week I said I want to make extraordinary decisions. When I come up to a place in my life where I got to make a decision on something, the question that, that is asked is what would an extraordinary person decide to do in this situation? What would an extraordinary person do? Not what everyone else would do. What would an extraordinary person do in this situation? And then say, I'm going to commit to living an extraordinary life this week. What do you think God could do this week in people's lives? I can tell you right now, there's a city waiting for you to, to be extraordinary. Romans says that creation is waiting for the sons of God, extraordinary people, to be revealed. For your workplace to know you are a son of God or a daughter of God. That they would know, you know that person? They're one of those Jesus freaks. Well, I don't want to be known as a freak. You know, I don't want to be, I was called a freak. That rejection of being known as a freak, that would just mess me up. Really? I mean, make it fun. Make it fun. Act like a Jesus freak. I mean, make it fun. You know, they only pick on you because you, you do, do you know why people pick on you? Because you don't like it. When you stop minding it, they'll stop picking on you. It's, it's a reality of life. That's, that's not part of the sermon. That was one of those. You know, they, they like it because it kind of annoys you, so they do it. When you just not let, they'll let it bother you, you just be, you know what? You'll have more people that will come up to you when they're in a desperate point in your life, and they will become your best friend because they'll be sitting and going, I called you all of those things, and you still stuck by it, and I know you're real, you're authentic. You're extraordinary. You're extraordinary. I know right now I'm looking at a room full of extraordinary people, an army, that today could probably be around the same number of soldiers that Gideon had when he fought that army of about 300 people, both services, all of those things, you add them all up, is about that many people that, that are going to go out into this thing, and all he had was a lamp and a trumpet. And you got the spirit of the Lord. What could you do? What will you do? You will strike down the enemy and raise up the flag of glory. Okay? Will you bow your head for one moment?